passage of scripture today is taken from Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. If you want to leave me a message about this particular message here or something in general, go to my website, robinbrumfield.com, and go to the contact page and leave me a message, and I'll get back with you. Throughout history, one life has made a huge impact. We see that all throughout history. Those men and women changed the course of events during their time. We can see such an example in Hebrews chapter 11. This chapter is often referred to as the Hall of Fame of Faith. Recorded there are people like Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, not to leave out Joseph, Moses, Rahab, and Sarah, among many others that, that are mentioned there in that particular chapter. You see, God used these people to change the course of history. He used them in, in a mighty way. And as we think back these past weeks in, in our study, these past few weeks, we see that Martin Luther was such an individual. A closer look at the significant individual is worth our study. He was the son of a poor German miner and was born on November 10th, 1483, an hour before midnight. Isn't it amazing that this was appropriately the 11th hour, maybe a prophetic hour indeed, marking the birth of this man. One historian said, Luther had a hard youth without sunny memories and was brought up under stern discipline. Close quote. And upon one occasion, he was chastened by his mother so severely that she brought forth blood with her chastening. And then uh, his father, uh, who flogged him to such a degree that he fled from his presence. So Martin Luther had a rough uh, childhood. Another historian stated it this way, the appeal to fear used in the church struck terror into his youthful conscience, close quote. And he saw in a window in the church a picture of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, I quote, Jesus with frowning face threatened judgment to come. How could he, how could Christ save his soul, save Martin Luther's soul? That question obsessed him, close quote. That leads us to something that we need to really realize is that Martin Luther wanted to be right with God. And the question that obsessed him is, how could he be saved? How could he be saved? He, he didn't understand salvation. There was no comfort to be found in the church either. The church was corrupt to the core. He couldn't find any uh, consolation, any love in the church. And Luther actually saw three different factors uh, about the decay of the church. One of them he saw was the moral decay with promiscuity practiced among the priests. The priests were immoral. They were uh, having illicit relationships with the members of that would come to them for asking spiritual blessings. And also the church members were ignorant of the scriptures and why not? Uh, the Bible was written in Latin, a dead language to the people. They didn't understand Latin. It was only the priests that understand Latin. There was no way they could understand the scriptures. And then there was also materialism among the priest. The priest offered indulgences. You pay me a certain amount of money and I will pray for you and, and God will answer your prayer. So the priests were all about the money and 
and for materialism, it was rampant in the church. This led Luther to search the scriptures. Surely someplace in the scriptures, I can find relief from all this, especially in the book of Romans. He spent a lot of time studying the book of Romans. We saw in a previous message how Christ used Romans 1, verse 17, to bring Martin Luther to salvation, seeing that Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, where he took on Luther's sins and our sins, gave him salvation, and that his desire of them was to make Christ Lord of his life. But there were other verses in Romans that played a part in leading Martin Luther to that grand summation truth of 117. Among other verses were Romans 3, verses 21 through 24, to lead Luther along this path of truth. We'll focus our attention today on Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. In verse 23, we see that the overall writing principle here is no one is sinless. For all have sinned, it says everyone has sinned. There's no one that is exempt. This is exactly the point that's emphasized in the first three chapters of Romans, is that there is no one who is sinless, for we have all sinned and fall short, meaning that we haven't been able to obtain the righteousness of God. And it says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is the praise of God. The glory of God is what everything is about. That's why God created the heavens, why he created the earth, why he created man, why he allows unbelievers and believers and everything that is done is all for the glory of God. And God says, I share my glory with no one. And what this verse in particular is saying is that we as people have tried to be justified by God, but we failed. We have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And then as we turn our attention to verse 24, we see that there is deliverance. <laughs> Praise God, there's deliverance. There's deliverance through Jesus Christ. It says they're being justified, being treated as if we are righteous, not by any merit of ours, by anything that we've done or anything of our own that we have accomplished, it's freely given. It's not something that you can purchase with any type of material or any type of uh, factor at all. It, there's no payment required. It is completely free. It's absolutely free. And it's an undeserving gift. We don't deserve this free gift that we get, we don't deserve that. It all happens by his grace. By Christ's grace, we are given this deliverance. It's by God's favor to us that he gives it. He gives it totally by his favor. You see, grace is us receiving something that we don't deserve to receive. We get it, but we don't deserve the gift that we've gotten it. That's what God's grace is all about. We're a product of God's grace in our lives. Everything that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, our means of even existence, is all by God's grace. No matter how small or how large the gift, everything is a gift through God's grace. This abounding grace is the summation of our lives. Our lives are a summation of God extending his grace to us. We deserve nothing. We don't deserve any of this. But Christ fills our lives with his blessing. He gives us his blessings because he loves us. 
And, and we see that it is by his grace, through the redemption, th this phrase, through his redemption, actually occurs 10 times in the New Testament. It, it, its root it comes from a price paid for a prisoner of war. You have a prisoner of war, a, a fee is paid, and they're set free. With this payment being paid, the prisoner is allowed to go free. And the word redemption here denotes deliverance from sin. It, it, we have uh, redemption that is deliverance from our sins and even the consequences of the sins that we have done. You see, that is what grace is all about. And how does this come? It says that is in Jesus Christ. The deliverance from sin and its consequences come through Christ. It's only through Christ that we get this deliverance. Christ is the author of it, and he's also the procurer of this deliverance. This deliverance from sin and its power in our lives comes through faith in Jesus Christ, comes through faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, Savior with his death on the cross, dying for us and us accepting that payment and then living our lives for his glory, making him the Lord of our lives is what it is talking about. Accepting Christ's death on the cross to be just before God. That is what led Martin Luther to realize that it's through Christ that we need salvation and that we get salvation only through him. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. No man comes to the Father. You hear people saying, well, this is quite, Christianity is one way, but it's not the other way. Well, that's not what Christ said. Christ said, I am the only way that you can have salvation, that you can have eternal life in heaven. Several truths were living. We are all sinners before Christ. Every one of us has sinned. Every person on earth has sinned. We need a redeemer. And because of that, we are all made just by Christ's work on the cross. It's by what Christ did on the cross that makes us justified, makes us just, makes us righteous before God because of his sacrifice. And then we also need to remember that just like Martin Luther, we all are just one, but we can make a difference. Your difference may not be as huge as Martin Luther's was, but you're the only one with the surrounding friends that you have, with the family that you have. You may be the one that makes a difference in that child's life that is a sibling of yours, that son or daughter, your impact may impact them for eternity. You never know, and you won't know until you get to heaven. But one thing is sure, we all make an impact. We make an impact. It's just is our impact going to be good or not so good? That is up to us. Let's make sure that we make a positive impact in the world that we live in for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for your love for us. And thank you for creating us, Lord. Just help us be sensitive to the things that happen to the people you bring in our lives that we will make an impact for Jesus Christ. In his name that we pray, amen. If you have a question about this particular message or anything in general, go to my website, robinbrumfield.com, to the contact page. Until next Tuesday, have a great week.